Welcome to the second uh, round of uh, Lightning Talks. How are you enjoying uh, PyCon until now? <laughs> the weather is nice, the city is beautiful. I believe you enjoy it. Okay, uh, actually, instead of uh, Lightning Talks, we are going to do some uh, readings uh, from my initvim file. I'm fo I hope that you are going to take notes because I have it on my cell phone only. Can you follow it? Um, so in the beginning, you will have to define the, whether you have loaded the Python provider. If you use uh, Python 3, uh, it is the package uh, Python uh, NeoVim. In between, I will ask Sofia to tell us something about the work of a data scientist. Oh, data analyst, sorry. Okay, and then you can uh, call the plugins. I am uh, using uh, plugged, so I just uh, list uh, all the plugins afterwards. Uh, after Sofia. Give her a big hand. Um, hello, everyone, again. I got a very warm feedback uh, from my talk yesterday. Thank you very much, everyone. It was it's really nice to hear. And uh, so today I decided to make one more talk. Um, I, I hope it will be also OK, because I, I mean, yesterday the idea I had, it was my from really from heart. This one is also from heart, but not like that much. So, but let's see, this, this, is, is, this OK. So OK, the story I want to say, it, it's the story actually which happened to me. So again, nothing I invented. And the reason why I'm giving this talk, well, why I'm here, because I want to say that the job of data analyst is does not always have to do something, does not necessarily have to do something with machine learning, with deep learning. Sometimes it can be a very small step very small thing which you do and you can save the project and you can save the situation so what actually happened um, once a few months ago my boss came to me and he was like okay Sophia could you help our co-worker um, and then I was like all right then co-worker came to me and the problem was that so there was a patent so we don't talk about like just a deadline it was a deadline for a pa patent they were patenting something but they couldn't show something they couldn't show some dependency some relation between some variables of course I cannot name which exactly variables, but just, just in general the idea. So this coworker was really very stressed and he was supposed to cancel his vacation because they had this problem with the patent. And um, then I went to his office and in 20 minutes he explained to me like very briefly um, about, the, about the problem. Of course, there were more words which I did not know than I did know because it was all about the, this, the process which I was not before, I didn't know it before. And uh, so at the end, he gave me around 50 CSV files, and um, each f CSV file was around 10,000 lines and um, around 10 columns, so typical, let's say, task for data analyst. And um, so what I did, like this, my coworker, he did not do any programming, so he didn't do programming. Like he was not able to analyze 50 CSV files because it takes time to open it to, to do something if you have a patent and urgent task. So what I did, I used pandas as we talked during last two hours about. One line for importing pandas, one line for load this CSV file. They had all the same similar format, so it was completely no problem. And then I did like different statistics. I took some minimums and maximum of some columns and so on. And at the end, so I just took a maximum over raw number 5,500. I just took maximum over the raw. So we don't talk about machine learning or deep learning or anything. It's just so simple. It's just a few lines in pandas. But my coworker was really happy. He went to my boss. He said that I get 11 points out of 10 for my work, he went to his vacation actually, and everyone was happy, I saved the patent, the boss was happy, I was famous in the company, and I just wrote like few <laughs> lines, few lines of code. And so what I want to say in this that for people who maybe are afraid to be data analysts because they're afraid they will have some accuracy which will not satisfy your boss, sometimes there is no accuracy, sometimes you just do a small thing and every, everything is right. So in industry, yeah, sometimes you don't need to do much to to do a good job, let's say. <laughs> Thank you, Sofia. Maximilian? So in the beginning, if you are programming in Python, it's a good idea to set tab stop to four, soft tab stop to four, expand tab, auto ident, and shift width to four. As a fan of tabs, I have to rectify the last thing. Expand tabs is shit. No pick. 
picture. <laughs> With a dark background, so set background dark, and color scheme, I prefer solarized. Who is using solarized dark? Yeah. Oh, great. They like better. Um, for the screen width, uh, we usually stop at uh, 80 characters, so you can put several terminal uh, windows next to each other. Huh? <laughs> and the color column to set it also at 80, so there is a vertical line. Um, set wrap, set format options, uh, I use uh, Q, R, N, and 1. Any other opinions? Uh, set the number, set relative number, so you see on which line you are and you will see if you want to move like 10 lines uh, up and 10 lines uh, down, uh, you will see how, uh, how many lines uh, you have to move. Uh, the current line will be highlighted by uh, cursor line. Hmm? We try HD. Yeah. <laughs> set scroll off, I set it to three. Scroll off, it means that you can, you, you always stay with your cursor out of the edge of the screen. So if you scroll down and uh, you always see three more lines uh, uh, after your current line. Finish? One more. <laughs> With uh, scroll off is uh, for the vertical movement. For horizontal movement, I am using side scroll off five and side scroll 10. Thank you. Now for something completely different. Um, Linux firewalls, a Linux firewall framework, something I built 12 years ago. Are you afraid of the cyber? If you are, I guess you are. Um, and you are in need of a decentralized firewall with some view of the network topology, this may be some project for you. Should it run on Linux? Of course it should. Should it be open source? Of course it should. And should it be in Python? So there is Alf. This guy. Um, how does this thing work? There is one central point of configuration, central point of truth. You define your networks, like the IP networks or VLANs or interfaces, whatever, which are configured on all the firewall boxes distributed in the, your topology. You can define your topology. This thing is aware of uh, services, like there is a web server, this IP, this port, UDP, TCP, whatever. This combination is some service, and it knows about security classes, like this is behind the firewall, this is in front of it, we trust these kind of networks. These networks are for our employees, we trust them or we don't. These are for whim hackers, and so on. Um, this thing is built in Python since two years ago, I think, before it was in Perl, which sucked. Um, you can extend it by adding some modules written in Python, or you can extend it by some modules written in any language as, uh, as well as you can, we can execute this script or whatever it is. Um, if there is an ALF, there needs to be a cat, so there is a config accepted tool which will run on every firewall, which will make sure that uh, if the new rule set, rule set you provided does not load or you cannot connect back after loading the new rule set on the firewall machine, it will do a rollback. Um, you should know about what AP tables is and how it works. It's not like other solutions where you can click your rules together, it's all from the CLI. If you don't know how to use AP tables, this tool is not for you, but then you shouldn't uh, configure firewalls anyway, in my opinion. Um, if you wanna use it, what do you need? Some Linux. Debian is the best Linux available, at least within these five minutes of this talk. You need uh, NetFilter, you need ALF, of course, and you need SSH to connect to your firewall machines. If you want to be really cool and you want to do high availability, which is possible, you want, uh, maybe you want to use Heartbeat or Keep Alive D or something in this era to configure the virtual IP addresses here or here. Like uh, Active Passive System, you want to use Contract D for stateful failover. All these things are in Debian. Where do you get it? There. Um, I guess we can put all these presentations to some Git repository later, so you don't have to write it down. If you have questions, hunt me later at the social or here around. Thank you.
I forgot to ask Niels to come for his lightning talk. Okay, he's coming. Uh, we don't want to pollute uh, our, the directories where the, are the files we are editing, uh, so you said undo file. It will put all your swap uh, and undo files into the .config uh, nvim directory. Uh, when we are searching, uh, it is a good idea to search um, literally for the things that you need. So it means that n no remap and v uh, no remap uh, slashes you map them to slash uh, backslash v. Uh, if uh, you are searching for something and uh, it highlights like the half of your screen, uh, you want to remove uh, all the highlights. So you n no remap uh, the leader and space to uh, colon no hl search cr. You set ignored case, set uh, smart case, and G default, and uh, you can also remap uh, leader A to AG. So now Neil is going to speak about BICDAS. Here, thanks. Okay, so I would like to introduce you to the Bielefeld Center for Data Science, or Big Dust for short. But you might uh, hang to that conspiracy, yes. <laughs> if that is true, I, I'm actually not even married. That would be kind of a pity. <laughs> okay, whatsoever. Um, this is an uh, actually new, uh, pretty newly found center for uh, at the Bielefeld University. Um, it is uh, uh, virtual in that regard, as uh, I'm uh, currently not only its director, but only employee. Uh, we are uh, basically um, uh, cross-sectioning all of the university. The uh, people who are really doing the work are from all over the university, different faculties, institutions. Uh, it is in that regard also decentralized. It uh, has emerged from a round table data science, which has been there for quite, uh, about a year now. Um, and in that regard, it's, it's kind of a bottom-up uh, thing. And um, yeah, our approach to data science, if I may say so, is... Uh, kind of a holistic one, holistic in that regard, at the, uh, as that we are, come on, okay, here it is. Uh, we are um, having this, uh, we are c uh, considering all of the, this data life circle. You may have seen different versions of this. So from asking a question about finding the correct data over exploration, uh, interpretation, Storage, retrieval, linking, sharing, all of this uh, is uh, uh, our topic. And um, why can I? Ah, this way. Okay. And it is interdisciplinary in that regard as uh, we are... Uh, um, People come from all over the university, so from, uh, of course, the technical faculty, biology, also institutions like the Center for Biotechnology, Sociology, uh, even Law Studies, uh, the Center for uh, Cognitive Interaction Technology, Physics, History, uh, the Center for Statistics, Center for Conflict Research, Linguistics. Uh, is the, we have also some... Um, non-scientific uh, stuff on board, which are important partners, particularly our information security officer, the uh, university IT center, and the university library, so all over the place. Um, yeah, so uh, for my work, I've uh, um, defined four key areas which I want to emphasize, which is uh, uh, fostering data science related research, uh, promoting uh, the application of data science all over university research, supporting that uh, application of data science, and of course data science related teaching. Uh, some current projects we are pursuing is giving a, preparing a lecture series for, uh, on data science for the second half of the term. Uh, I will uh, uh, put a promotion for that on our web uh, website shortly. Um, a data science day, somewhat next year. 
uh, we are giving ourselves an advisory board. Uh, we want to uh, provide uh, later on data science related training and uh, something I've called uh, data science powered labs because the labs are basically where really the research uh, happens in the university. So if we can introduce the sort of data science here, that's uh, how we really get data science into uni university research. Uh, and uh, last but not least, we are, offering, we are planning to offer a master degree course on data science, probably for winter term 2018. Uh, 2019 and yeah so uh, if you are interested in the victors in collaborating with victors and finding out more about victors or, or whatever you can uh, contact us contact me uh, the uh, address is simply uni-bielefeld slash data science. Uh, you can find us on Twitter. Uh, you can call, mail, whatsoever. Yeah, that's about it. Thank you very much. Uh, Malte on the stage? Is he here? Yeah. So you don't want, if you don't know how to escape uh, from uh, Vim, you don't want to annoy your colleagues, so you set visual bell, please. Uh, lazy redraw, wild mode to list uh, column longest, uh, show comment, no show mode, hidden, and I set always pass to uh, asterisk, asterisk, because it allows me to start from the root of the project, and uh, I can column find uh, any file uh, after just uh, a few letters uh, of my uh, of, of, the, of, the, of the file name. Uh, as a Python programmer, I set wild ignore to pi yc. Uh, VGA? Does it work, VGA? Should vi visual bell? Yes. Nee, nee, ik was niet. Ik was op de landing. So, uh, it is nice to get an overview over the file. So, uh, folding. Uh, Usually you open or close it with ZA, ZF, uh, but I now remap them with uh, spaces. Uh, the movements, uh, according to, re to physical and visual lines, uh, with J and K can be mapped to from from GJ and GK can be mapped to J and K. Uh, right. the, my light line uh, is a little bit longer, so I will let it after. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um. <laughs> yes, like uh, just um, to top the Vim configuration. Actually, there is about 20 years of um, change history missing, but no, that's not what I'm going to talk about. Okay, no, focus. Right. Um, so I stumbled. Uh, on the problem how to do uh, real-life exception handling and I think that's the missing how-to on the Python page. So why should you define your own exceptions? What kind of exception handling is actually useful and when is the exception the rule? I'm just saying stop iteration. So um, my approach is what type of causes do we have? Well, there could be external things like the disk is full, network connection is lost and it uh, wasn't there. Um, then the user, of course, can mess things up massively. <laughs> and so can we as developers. So um, the other perspective to take is can the application recover by itself or can it at least degrade gracefully or do we not even know how to get out of this illegal state. And the other uh, question is, can we ask the user to help us, like plug in the network cable or make some space on the disk? So the problem in a real application is that usually you have a nice architecture, you've got user interaction here, and somewhere here you hit a problem. So how do you get this back to the user? Um, and that, for me, was the main cause uh, or main reason for defining 
uh, our own application exceptions so that we can communicate anticipated problems and kind of log the real exceptions like program errors in debug mode. So if you uh, think you ca your application can recover, raise an exception with a useful help message, reset the application state if possible, and inform the user with that helpful message. If it's a programming error or any kind of unforeseen uh, thing, um, let them bubble up to the top, log the exception, say, sorry, unexpected error. Windows has done this for decades, so it can't be that bad. So apologize and exit. <laughs> so um, our top level kind of looks like this. We define a class of a class hierarchy of our own. We call it application uh, error here. And then um, this is from a TK inter thing. We uh, define the exception handler there. Um, uh, this way that we say, right, we want to, oops, sorry, we want to stop. Um, if it's an application error here, we do something to, um, uh, here we don't do anything. If we get more errors while we're trying to reset the state, well, uh, uh, I think we're in a mess, so we can't do anything. Um, Give an information, uh, uh, information uh, to the user, and then like, if it's not something that you foresaw, exit. Just a very stripped down example of our handler. Um, so the only things I could find on the topic, Miguel Grinberg and some local Pime meetup in the US had this presentation, Error Handling in the Real World, where he coined not just look before you leap, LBFL and EAFP, but YOLO, you only live once. So don't do anything about the exception, let someone else handle it. Um, a couple of years back, um, uh, Thomas Glassinger had an approach which was more about the helpful messages. And um, there's a general article here by Kevin Matz which um, also tries, uh, like where it took some of the cues of, uh, about categories of exceptions. So that's probably worth uh, reading. Thanks. Eberhard, Lightline. You always need uh, some status, uh, don't need it really, but it's helpful to have a status line, and I find light line quite uh, useful. Uh, of course, the color scheme is uh, solarized. Um, I put a small sign whether the file, current file is read only. Uh, in the line info, I get the current line. No, don't, don't, I even don't get the current line, and the current column is not really interesting. Uh, there is some fugitive, so uh, information on your current um, Git um, uh, branch name. Uh, then the form of the uh, file. Uh, what, what is the encoding, whether it is UTF-8? UTF-8 or um, uh, other encoding, 99% uh, of files I use uh, are UTF-8, so I don't need this information, only if it is some other file format, a file encoding, I uh, need it and uh, let uh, it show. Uh, the same thing with uh, the um, um, endings, with the line uh, endings, uh, uh, new lines uh, in uh, Unix uh, are the default for me, so if it is something else coming from Macintosh or, uh, or Windows world, uh, I want to see it. Uh, spelling, uh, the list of all languages uh, that my current document is in. Uh, for a normal business email, you usually mix uh, German and uh, English, so you don't want the en English and German and the English uh, words uh, highlighted. And uh, also a, a small symbol whether the file is uh, s spell checked uh, or not. Uh, and there is... Uh, oh! Another one. Do we have uh, Tobias? Tobias, can you come? Oh, so maybe we'll get the whole team of uh, Lightline through. 
Uh, in the beginning of the line, there is usually have like visual, normal, insert. Uh, you don't need so much. You just uh, put uh, one letter in the right color, so you can map uh, the symbols uh, in uh, light line. Uh, within light line, I also have use a buffer line. It shows the list of buffers uh, with uh, highlighted uh, the current one. Okay, so that was light line, that was power line. It's too short. It's too short. You are too tall. No, it, no, 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 no. The interaction in terminal in NeoVim uh, works with uh, control backslash control N. I pr uh, prefer to map it to leader E. Uh, the uh, jumping between windows uh, with control H, J, K, L, which is mapped from control W and H, J, K, L. Okay. So it works. Okay. Um, I'd like to talk about uh, salt in the kitchen. Um, we are doing some um, testing with our infrastructure uh, stuff. The infrastructure as code, do it in a CI CD form and on different platforms. Uh, that's why I'm using uh, Kitchen here. Um, it's based uh, from the Chef Universe, written in Ruby. Uh, okay, but we don't care, we are only using the tool. Uh, it prepares virtual machines and apply your code to it and run a test suite at the end, hopefully. So, there are um, different. Um, uh, things to remember, it's a kitchen converge. It prepares a virtual machine, including your provisioning stuff. <clears throat> the kitchen login, you can look around in the virtual machine after you have uh, started this. In kitchen verify, it can run your tests. And kitchen tests, um, it's mainly for the um, CICD stuff. Uh, so it runs uh, the, the provisioning, and uh, afterwards it cleans everything up. And um, if you're doing interactive uh, testing with the kitchen stuff, um, it shows uh, information about the status of the current kitchen project. So um, there are several kitchen provisioners, and you can use Saltzik, Ansible, Chef, Puppet, and um, I think you name it, um, to, to provision your uh, infrastructure as code. And there are several kitchen drivers, what you can power up as your virtual machine. Um, most of the time we're using on our local development um, uh, computers background with VirtualBox and maybe VMware, uh, but you can use it directly on EC2, DigitalOcean, uh, maybe with Docker, and I heard from a colleague he's using it with Hyper-V. There are some Windows users around, maybe. Um, and all of this YAML ops stuff is, uh, you write the configuration in YAML, now we'll go uh, short through this uh, stuff. So you name it uh, a driver, name it Vagrant in this uh, example. Then you say uh, platforms. Now um, I'm using here uh, VMware or VirtualBox. So I get the Vagrant boxes from the Chef universe. The Bento is uh, provided by the Chef uh, guys with the Debian 8.6 and CentOS 6.8, for example. You can use a huge list and on every kitchen run, uh, all of these platforms are executed. You can provision uh, with, in this example, with uh, Salt Solo. It's um, um, just without a server, just applies the Salt states on, the, uh, on your VMs. With, in this example, MongoDB, it's a Salt formula. I don't want to talk about this. Uh, and you can uh, say, as is, is it's from the Chef universe, don't require Chef. I'm, I don't care about it. I don't want this Ruby stuff. So a little bit of salt sex stuff. So you can uh, put uh, the pillars and uh, how to, to glue them together. Now I'm testing here. OK, I put some Nginx in there, OK. Um, and you test the suits with it. So you can put other things together. Um, so you're testing the, the server suit uh, here. I have no and a mask. Oh, I have a mask. I have no mask. 
Okay, um, you put this in Nginx uh, suit here and uh, below that Nginx third suit. It's the testing suit you're executing. And <laughs> a little bit ugly. Um, finally, with Python, uh, you just uh, put the PyTest against your, your hosts uh, you have spawned up with the Vagrant provider in this example. And uh, we're using test infra for the testing of this stuff. It's a PyTest plugin. Uh, maybe someone knew server spec. It's all from the Chef and Ruby universe. It's equivalent in Python and comes with helpers for testing with lots of stuff like checking files, sockets, or run Ansible salt modules, um, and a lot of other things. And uh, you're writing a test to test your infrastructure with PyTest. You can use um, simple um, fixtures and, and so on, and um, write a test package stuff. Um, the host fixture is uh, from, from, uh, from a little bit outside, then you put the name and version on it. Well, most of you uh, know PyTest. I'm finished? Okay. Uh, how to get it? Game Kitchen install, test infra, pip install, and <laughs> one more thing. You can use Nagios with it. So, how do we do it with uh, web browser? Now, we are coming to a little bit longer line. Uh, it is uh, the usage of uh, tab. I'm uh, mixing <laughs> Neo snippets, uh, Dioplit, and it, this is just a longer line, so I'm going to dictate it. No? So IMAP, expert tab, Neo snippet, expandable or jumpable. Finish? Yeah. So uh, sorry for the technical glitch earlier, but I really like Vim, so that's actually really interesting to me. Um, <laughs> I, I have two kids. One is uh, a boy close to three years old and a daughter, which is four weeks and five days. Um, and the older one really likes listening to music. And when he was about one and a half years old, I was tired of handing him my smartphone to listen to music. Um, so he could push the play button, but uh, he still had some difficulties in reading the song titles. So um, I set out to build an MP3 player that a one and a half year old can use on his own. And this is it, including all of the user interface. Um, so what you see here, <laughs> what you see here is these little chips. These are actually repurposed poker chips. I don't get to play poker anymore. I don't know why. Um, and on the front, we draw a little symbol that shows the song. On the back, I stick an NFC tag. And then you put the chip into the blue circle. And then the song plays once. And if you take it off, it stops playing. And that's all there is in user interface. And a one, one and a half year old can really use that on his own. Um, now what's inside the box? Uh, there is a Raspberry Pi, of course. Uh, there is an NFC tag reader, which is uh, screwed to the top of the box. There is a pair of USB speakers. So it's all self-contained. It just needs power. And it has a lock, so he can't open it on his own. <laughs> Now, um, since this is a Python conference, it's obvious that this thing is controlled by Python. Um, so Python is used for the NFC communication and to start playback, stop playback. Uh, actually, it's debounced because sometimes um, the, the reader misses a read of a tag and I don't want to stop the song and play it from the beginning, so this, the, the reading is debounced. It also has a web interface, which is a Flask app. So um, the Raspberry Pi runs its own Wi-Fi network. That network shuts off after three minutes if you don't use it, because on the one hand, there is a bit of interference with the USB speakers. But on the other hand, you also don't want unnecessary radiation to bounce around your kid's room. Um, this uh, interface, it scans your Raspberry Pi storage for music files. Then you can put a tag onto the reader and push a button and it will assign that song to the respective NFC tag. So it's really easy to reconfigure your, your tags via, via that interface. Um, the code is all in the repository. There's a shopping list for how I built this thing, um, and there's some uh, instructions on how to 
get it up and running. There's currently one instance of this in the world, uh, but I would be thrilled if this would be useful for uh, some mom or maybe dad in the audience. And if you build one of these, please let me know. If you need help building one of these, please also let me know. Thanks very much. So Christian is coming. Where are we? In which column? OK, now so now we are going to see the list of uh, the plugins. Uh, you cannot go wrong with Tim Pope. So hey, from can, can we switch microphones? Yeah. Right. So Tim Pope. So from Tim Pope, you can take, huh? you can take like uh, Vim speed dating, uh, Vim surround, Vim characterize, Vim abolish, Vim unimpaired, Vim commentary, Vim fugitive, Vim markdown, Vim and stuff. A second, um, I need to switch mirroring. And also some others, some from Shogo. I take Dioplit, context file type, Neo pairs, Neo snippet, Neo snippet snippets. From Zechi, I have Dioplit Jedi. From Arking, I have AJ. And from Benekasta, I have uh, Neo make. Altercation, Vim color serverized, Blink, Vim buffer line, Ichini light line. You have All seen right. the configuration. So here you are, Christian. Thank you. So I use Sublime, all right? Um, <laughs> um, sorry for having uh, spoken in German yesterday. Yesterday, Some people said that uh, you were pissed about that. Is that true? All right, OK. So I'm going to do that again, different topic and different language, all right? Um, so OK, Bateau. Bateau is a service and application deployment utility. Why? <laughs> Why another one? Um, Obviously, in the Python community, we love diversity. Um, uh, I do. And uh, also, um, it's got like 20 years of background almost in doing that stuff. And when I started Bateau, um, that was, I think the repository uh, is as old as Ansible. We have like two days of difference or something like that. So, um, OK, first thing is that I like opinionated tools. Um, I like tools that uh, don't get extended with other tools wrapped around them that become like huge. Uh, Ruby Goldberg machine, um, and there's a couple of other things that I picked up over time that uh, I wanted to have built into these things. Um, as this is a lightning talk, this is going to be like really fast, right? Um, so one thing that I like is that I want to have actual real single command stuff, and I mean that in the sense that when you have your repository where your deployment stuff is in there, you don't have a system-wide tool installed. You clone your repository, you initialize it, and you say dot slash bateau, which is embedded there, and it does everything, which means that every project can have a separate version of bateau, uh, and you don't have to remember which old project has which old version and stuff like that. Um, it's really just self-contained, and if another developer picks it up, he also gets the right version. Um, I want stuff to be declarative, um, and I only want to use a single language. I don't want to have like Python and then YAML and YAML with Jinja and like stuff like that. Um, so I only do everything in Python, and I, we have this kind of declarative way of uh, saying I want my application to be constructed from a virtual env and uh, that has a specific package, and then I want a supervisor program uh, for that. Uh, so declarative stuff, but I also need to do imperative things because at some point you have to actually do work, right? Um, so the imperative stuff is then uh, this is split up between two phases, a verify phase which checks whether your target system is already at the state you want to be, and if not, then you have an update function that gets called that actually does that. Um, and the important part for me is that I want to have a hybrid thing. Um, I want to be able to, when I start implementing uh, sysconfig stuff that is imperative, I want to be able to then, if this verify update thing becomes too complex, I want to be able to say, well, let's split this component into smaller components and leverage that in a, another declarative phase and keep splitting that up and up and up, uh, uh, kind of like a fractal, right? And this way, we model our application, uh, and you have multiple top-level components that then make up things like the front-end and the back-end, the database, load balancer, whatever. And you take that and you map that into an environment. Uh, so you have multiple hosts where you can say, these things go here, and Bateau figures out uh, how to wire them actually up, which network addresses are in there, et cetera. And if you run that, um, you just call it, and it goes ahead and does all the changes you want. Um, there's a certain feature checklist, um, just if you like to see whether you want to uh, have a look at it. And um, I was so fast, I have two minutes left. Dude, I could introduce another conference in these two minutes, but I'm not going to do that. So um, 
we've got we've got documentation there. Um, get in touch with me if you want to have a look at it. It's uh, another tool with uh, a certain variation on top of things. What? No, I don't have a conference. I just wanted to make a joke. Man, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Thank you. We have like last four minutes because do you have a very short lightning talk? Yeah. Very short. Come on. Actually, that's everything from my Vim file. Yeah. Now, in between, I can tell you a few informations to today's program. <laughs> Social event. Uh, so uh, everybody knows where it is in Badish Brauhaus. Uh, when you get into it, we have uh, the sub uh, the first underground floor reserved for us. Uh, you can use uh, elevator, you can use steps, and there is also a slide. When you come in, you do, uh, descend like five steps, and there is uh, an entrance to a slide next to a bar. So you just enter it, it's dark inside, but after it will be a uh, light at the end of the tunnel. <laughs> and there will be beer and other drinks. Uh, please get there time because uh, at, uh, between uh, 7 and 10 p.m. we have they will open the beer barrels and we will have to drink all beer there it is inside it's a brewery so it cannot it, there is enough beer for everyone also other non-alcoholic drinks uh, for the rest of the drinks and any drinks after 10 o'clock uh, you will have to pay yourself and there should be hopefully enough uh, food for everyone in the buffet uh, of uh, all sorts, so it means uh, dead animals, no dead animals, and so on. Are you ready? No? What else? Tomorrow we are starting at uh, quarter to nine. Peter, anything else? Huh? Museum tours, there are tomorrow there are two more museum tours. Who has more than, uh, who has got uh, already the 97 stickers to cover the whole one pay, uh, side of their uh, badge? Nobody? 96? 95? Nine? Okay. Like two? Ah, okay. <laughs> Tomorrow in the morning, don't be surprised when you get out of the hotel. It may, it may rain. That happens from time to time uh, to in Karlsruhe. It's just a statistical anomaly. So, here we are. Hello, everyone. So I'm going to make it very quick because uh, we don't want to miss out on the beer. So uh, I'm working at uh, Max Planck Institute for Software Systems on my thesis, and I'm working on uh, re-identification attacks for uh, statistical databases. And uh, since there are a lot of data scientists here today, so I thought maybe we'll talk about GDPR and data privacy today. So probably a lot of you already know what is GDPR. It's a new data protection regulation, uh, which is going to replace the data protection directive. And it's actually designed to unify the laws for all the EU citizens. And it doesn't only, mean, uh, it doesn't only uh, work for uh, the organizations which are in EU, but all the companies which operate outside EU but have clients in EU. So uh, basically all the major uh, companies. And then it comes into effect on 25th May, and it includes heavy penalties like 20 million euros or 4% of the global turnover. Now, GDPR, uh, it defines something very important. What is personal data? Since uh, it, it's all about personal data. And now, th there can be a lot of ways where you can identify a single user, user based on name, address, demographics, behavioral data and social data, like a lot of you already know, uh, Google used to scan your emails and then get metadata from them and give you personalized uh, ads. But now, maybe GDPR helped it. They recently announced that they're going to stop that practice. And a lot of users have generated con content like online comments, videos, and photos. So they also defined three key terms in GDPR. That is the data subject, the data controller, and the data processor. So I'll explain it quickly with an example. Suppose uh, you have a business and you sell customized uh, uh, laptop stickers. So you are the seller, that is the con uh, controller, and you sell it through eBay or Shopify or some other platform. 
So that is the processor. And the customer who you're selling to, that is the subject. So basically, you're the controller because uh, you, the customers entrust and they buy from you. And the processor is eBay or Shopify because they uh, process that system and they also have the data and they process according to you. And then they also have these three important subject rights. The subject which I explained in the previous slide, uh, that is right to be forgotten, access and rectification and portability. Uh, the favorite out of these is, for me, is right to be forgotten. It's pretty cool, right? You, you have a right that you can ask Google or Facebook that you want them to remove your data once uh, they've served the purpose for which you already gave the consent. So the keyword here is consent. The organizations need to have your consent to use your data. And they should basically ask for permission, not forgiveness. And then this portability. Uh, uh, I don't know if you, you guys know about this Google takeout page. You can actually uh, see what data Google has about you based on all the services. And uh, you can export that data. Uh, at least they claim that it's all the data they have, but everyone knows. We, we don't even realize what data they have because we don't know what, what they are. And from my thesis uh, supervisor. And it, it, it's a, it's a, it's a real-time database and organization system and very easy to use. You can just plug it into your database. And uh, we recently announced, announced this a cloak challenge, which is the world's first bounty program for re-identification attacks. And uh, in specifically, uh, this, is some, uh, this is exactly what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to make, uh, modify some existing attacks or find some new ways to attack these anonymized systems and then patch them up. Thank you. Okay, there are two more lightning talks for today, but we have no time left. Tomorrow? 22nd. Trust me. Really? Okay. Tuzla. Tuzla. What? So this is Michael with Python Software Verband Finite uh, Meetup for user groups. And the last one, the tenth one, will be postponed until tomorrow. It's mine, so it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, Mikhail. Yeah. Just a second. <laughs> Hello. <coughs> hey, Karlsruhe. I know we are all hungry, we are all thirsty, but I just want to inform you. We, the PiSV, have a finite program for every meetup here in Germany, Austria, Switzerland. It's the complete uh, German-speaking uh, yeah, Na uh, uh, region, thank you. And if you have interest for this, <laughs> please contact me over there. Hey, 20 seconds? <laughs> oh, really? Okay. <laughs> thank you. So, thank you very much. See you at the social event and tomorrow. Good evening. <laughs>